So hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. His name is Chaplain Sid Itma. Nobody calls him Chaplain. Everyone just calls him Sid. Um, he's been Chaplain for eight years now? Yeah, this is my ninth, going into my ninth year on campus. So yeah, he's been around for a while here at U Ottawa. Um, and he's originally from, or he came from a church in Port Alberni before he came here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Testing my trivia here. Um, and before that, grew up in Alberta. And now he's here to talk to us about um, if you treat the Bible as a recipe book, is it a recipe for disaster? Over to you, Sid. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for um, being here and uh, taking the time to uh, be a part of this. There's an old story that's floated around for many years about a man who uh, was struggling and, and wanted to figure out what God's direction for his life might be. And so he pulled open his Bible and he turned to Matthew 27, and he put his finger on a verse, and he read, and Judas departed, and he went out and hanged himself. He said, oh, okay, well, that, that, that's clearly, that's not, that's not God's will for my life. And so he, he flipped over, and he put, put himself to another passage where he went to Luke chapter 10, and he read, and Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You might be able to see the flaw in this process of reading scripture. Uh, simply flipping around and putting your finger on a text is, is a recipe for disaster because it, it creates narratives that were never intended. And as much as we maybe in the Christian world like to speak of the Holy Spirit guiding our conversation, there also is a certain amount of wisdom and thoughtfulness that goes into thinking about what the Bible is and how we read it. But it strikes me that many people, when they read scripture, this is what they do. They, they want to find truth, and so they open up the Bible in search of truth, and they read it so that they can somehow come to, to truth. And at times, it's almost as though they're reading it then as a, a recipe book or a cookbook, trying to find the right recipe for exactly how they're supposed to be. And in an age of marketing, uh, even in Christianity, there's now opportunities to find all kinds of different types of Bibles that will give you indexes and, and, and notes that allow you to, to search up a topic, and then you can flip over to it, and boom, you've got truth. Or you can go out and buy a plethora of different types of Bible study material, and if you work your way through that Bible study material and, and, and understand exactly what's going on, then boom. You've got truth. But, and this is where maybe some of my cynicism really starts to ramp up, um, because a lot of people don't actually spend a lot of time reading the Bible, and today is not a guilt trip in trying to make people read the Bible more, though if at the end of this you feel a little bit guilty and you want to read the Bible more, then I don't really feel bad about that either. <laughs> um, but my argument with it that there are a lot of people who aren't even looking for the recipes of biblical food that they're eating these days. Um, that the internet and Christian marketing machine have done a great job of providing Christian fast food for you to eat. And that by eating the Christian fast food, you don't even have to learn how to cook for yourself. Uh, just eat your, and this is for Aiden and Seth, just eat your truth nuggets. And uh, they taste good, and they're easy, and, and you can move on with the other pursuits in your life, which seems to be a bit of the way that people read scripture. They, they want to get their truth nuggets, and somebody tell me how it's supposed to work, and then I can get on with everything else. And the cookbook analogy matters to me in that it often feels like people have their favorite biblical recipes that they've received from grandma or grandpa or the gospel coalition or sojourners uh, take your pick of where your source is but they they have their favorite biblical recipes and they are then insistent that this is the only way to bake the cake and while some of these recipes are good and 
and actually make for really delicious food. There is some question that I have as to how much time the Christian church uh, wastes trying to make sure that everybody is cooking with the right recipe. And I wonder how much time we spend trying to defend that right recipe and defend the right collection of recipes in order to, to truly be able to get the right type of food. And in so doing, we lose some of what it means to really enjoy the meal. And at times, we lose sight of the fact that uh, the entire ambiance and, and scene around a meal is important. And questions of who is it that we're inviting to the table to eat that meal is important. And thinking about what it means to have laughter and shared stories, that the, the meal is there in some respects to set the table for something else. And that a part of the Christian church's focus isn't just on making sure they've got the right recipes, but those recipes and, and the food is there to serve something much larger. And that sometimes even a bad meal can still produce an incredible gathering of people as they eat together. Now, obviously, I've, I've, I've beat this metaphor to death. Um, I think you, you get the idea of what I'm talking about with respect to, to this idea of, of a cookbook. But what I'm concerned is, do we take the time to consider what the Bible is and consider how we read it and be careful not to simply see the Bible as something that we need to defend? Um, but understand how it is something that shapes something larger than ourselves. Now, this is a huge topic, and there's no way that I'm gonna be able to get into it in great detail tonight, but I hope that in getting into a few points that I'd like to look at, that it encourages people to dig a little deeper uh, into a journey of what it means to read God's word. So the first thought that I wanna consider is, the Bible is not the Quran. Now, I don't say that to be flippant, but last year when we hosted the Muslim-Christian Dialogue, it struck me that many of the ways that the, uh, the Bible and the Quran were talked about in terms of it being inspired by God, it was as though we were comparing two cookbooks and that we were, again, in some respects, talking about a recipe. The Muslim students spoke about how God uh, gave uh, the Quran, the message of the Quran directly through Muhammad. And then the Christians would talk about how the message of the Bible came through a number of different authors uh, into one book. But as I listened to the Christians speak about the inspired word of God, it sounded quite similar to the Muslim view. But in the long history of Christianity, um, we've never viewed the inspiration of scripture in the same way as, as a Muslim person would understand the Quran. The text is not seen as direct words that God placed in the pens of authors. Rather, God was working through authors in their time, in their place, in their context, with their personalities and experiences in order to shape the community of God. And where the Muslim believer worries about translation from Arabic into English because it will corrupt the direct words from God, the Christian believer should have no such worry. The Bible was originally written in Hebrew and the Old Testament and Greek and the New Testament. But it's not as though the, the New Testament writers felt compelled that they had to write holy scriptures in Hebrew. Rather, they wrote in their time, in their context, and in the language of culture. It was always appropriate to the culture and the time that it was in. And what the Christian church has accepted as the Bible was agreed upon three to 400 years after the time of Christ. And in wanting the church to, to have a unified understanding of what it means to be a Christian and to be a follower of Jesus, the early church fathers used a, a basic criteria, although there was lots of arguing in his time, because it happens with Christians in every age and every time. The basic criteria of what made it into the canon of the Bible is was it connected to an apostle? How closely was it connected directly to Jesus? I, 
And is it being used by the majority of the church? Does it actually have a regular voice in the life of the community of the church? And there were some obscure texts that were being used in some churches, but not very many. And, and part of the decision was, no, we want to stick to that which is actually being used, is actually shaping the Christian understanding, and, and try and remain unified to the message of Jesus Christ. And so then here we consider maybe the words of Paul to Timothy in his letter to Timothy. When he speaks of all scripture as being God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When Paul makes this statement, you know, he's not implying to Timothy, and these words that I'm writing right now are scripture. He's, he's writing a letter to Timothy. But just as Paul recognized that the Old Testament was crucial to shaping an understanding of who God is. The church through time and tradition has found that Paul's words in an apostle are crucial to understanding the shape and the formation of followers of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we have trusted that these words were shaping the early church and therefore they're good to shape the church throughout the ages. And these words are authoritative in the Christian church today because the church through time recognizes them as a unique gift from God. And ultimately, these words prove themselves to be fully reliable and trustworthy in witness through the church over time. And I'll just repeat that phrase. Ultimately, the words prove themselves to be fully reliable and trustworthy in the witness of the church, of the people, over time. Now, we can discuss some of that more when we get to question and answers. But the second point, then, is the Bible is incredibly complex. Maybe you've heard the phrase, shallow enough for an infant to wade into, but deep enough for an elephant to swim in. And when you think about that statement, it makes absolutely no sense. It's impossible. Uh, but yet it's true. It's one of those things that... When you come to the Bible, you can glean basic truths about life, about character, about who we're called to be. Those basic truths are there. But the minute we become arrogant enough to think that we can reduce the text to our understanding, we're done for. The Bible has historical narrative in it, but it's also filled with poetry and incredible different literary devices. And as Christians living in North America, we must remember that there is the challenge of translation. And too often, we're reducing it down to, to simple English uh, nuggets when we're missing the nuances of something that has nothing to do with uh, the English way we're, we're approaching the text. And to quote a Jewish rabbi, he says that reading the sacred text is often like uh, kissing your bride through a veil, where it's just not quite fully there. And sometimes the power of the text, it's not found in the information. It's found in something else. Sometimes it's found in the beauty of the way it's expressed. And some of that beauty gets lost in translation. And if anybody uh, loves art, they know that sometimes the power of a piece of art or a piece of music is found not simply in the notes, but it's found in even the medium of the instrument that it's played. There's something that is, is incredible beyond the actual notes and music that speaks to its beauty. And that reality exists within the contours of scripture as well. There is something beautiful and something important within the text that is beyond just the information we're trying to glean out of it. And sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you just need to sit back and let the power of the message come to you as it speaks to your soul in a comforting way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. They're powerful words that somehow resonate in ways of comfort. But by the same token, we need to let Scripture sometimes 
speak to us and let it resonate in the, in the depths of our gut that it churns and challenges us and also causes us to think about what is going on here. Daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Ouch. That is not fun to read. And now I've got something to think about. And sometimes it isn't necessarily in the, in the information, but something begins to churn that gets us thinking about, why is this being written? Where is this coming from? What place in, in corporate communities and in the individual would words like this come out of? And where can we find that today? Reading scripture is a very humbling experience. We know that scripture has shaped much of the world as we know it in many ways that we probably don't even realize today. But we shouldn't come to the text and assume that we'll always understand it. We are entering a world that is not our own. And entering into scripture can be confusing and exhilarating all at the same time. But when we enter into scripture, we know we will be changed for the experience. And we should always be ready to be changed and transformed and not just come to the text looking for it to somehow validate the opinions we already have. But this means that we have to be careful, which brings me to my third point, which is that the Bible is not a weapon. These days, I'm sometimes scared to go on Facebook because the Christian narratives being presented often lack humility. From right to left, we see people quoting the Bible to defend their cultural position. And the first thing I think we need to consider is what actually is the cultural matter we're trying to discuss. And the second thing to consider is what is the idol that I'm holding on to or trying to defend that causes me or us to read and interpret scripture in the way that I do. As David Coises, uh, who's gonna be our Feast and Faith guest in October, so this is a shameless plug, um, <laughs> author of the book, Political Visions and Illusions, as he writes in this book, he talks about how, how all of our pl current political debates, we actually hold to a lot of classical liberal ideals whether it's an idolatry of human rights or an idolatry of financial stability, most of our debates tend to revolve around individual liberties and putting ourselves at the center of the story. And that is true whether you're on the right or left in the political divide. So often the debates tend to come down to me, my world. As Christians, we want to turn to the Bible not to defend my world, but to shape a vision of something larger than myself. But because we are all creatures of experience, we tend to interpret the Bible from our experience, my experience. And in so doing, we often read it from the position of being the one who's in the correct position or in the right spot. And this is true. When we read scripture, and the example I'll use is the Good Samaritan. When we read the Good Samaritan, we're all ready to pat the Good Samaritan on the back. And we'll put ourselves in the position of being the Good Samaritan. Or sometimes we'll put ourselves in the position of being the victim. But rarely are we ready to put ourselves in Scripture in the position of being the Levite or being the Pharisee who passed by on the other side. Or if you go into the Old Testament, we're almost always ready to put ourselves in the position of Israel. What does it mean to read scripture and at times put ourselves as the Canaanite? Then how do we hear scripture? Then how do we think about what its message is? Or when we think about Jonah, it's easy to, to look down on, on Jonah and, and, and maybe sometimes see the Christian church as Jonah, but what if the Christian church is Nineveh? And at times uh, is the one who is 
has been the one that's been doing certain things, or the Western world is Nineveh and has been doing things in, in a, a way that oppresses. And, and you can understand maybe why Jonah doesn't necessarily feel all that fond of Nineveh. Part of it is, is when we read scripture, we need to try and figure out not just what my experience is right now and that the center's the story is all about me is, how, how can I consider the other? How can I consider the different characters of the story and also recognize that in the room that I'm in and in the spaces of a university, all of those characters are probably right here too. And how can the Bible help me be empathetic and understanding to the different realities of life all around us? And here again, I wanna go back to the problem of reading the Bible like a cookbook. The Bible does not set out to try and defend us in whatever position we hold. It gives us a vision of who God is, what humans are prone to and often enter into, and it gives us story after story that should drive us in directions that can be counterintuitive to our personal preferences. It gives us story after story that point us to the incarnation of Jesus in a way that usually stands out in whatever time, place, and cultural context it stands. As we read and live scripture, does it bear witness to something greater than my individual pursuit of happiness? And so we come to my favorite metaphor of what the Bible is, and it comes from one of my favorite theologians, Walter Brueggemann, and his book, Texts Under Negotiation. Brueggemann writes, the Bible is the compost pile that provides material for new life. Brueggemann writes, I do not use this figure as an irreverent metaphor to suggest that the Bible is garbage. Rather, I use it to suggest that the Bible itself is not the actual place of new growth. Our present life, when we undertake new growth, is often inadequate, arid, and even barren. It needs to be enriched. And for that enrichment, we go back to the deposits of old growth that have been discarded, but that continue to ferment and may, continue and may contain resources for a way to new life. The Bible is not the end that needs to be defended. The Bible does not need defending. The Bible is a means to the more and other of the kingdom of God. It is the compost that we need for new growth. And sometimes compost smells and it's filled with things that we don't always want to touch. But as any good gardener knows, compost is the best fertilizer. And therefore the food that Christians eat is not fast food, but slow, year over year, fruits and vegetables from a vast garden that has been nourished with compost. May your year be a year of composting with God. So as I mentioned, any question is on the table regarding scripture and thinking about what is the Bible. Um, I had listed that. I think it's worthy of talking about uh, the Bible as well in, in respect to how is it that there are such opposing positions being defended um, on, on current topics and you know how do we deal with that. I, I'm happy to go in any direction you guys want to go because this should be somewhat a, a time of being able to ask questions. For those of you who are online, um, feel free to uh, ask a question in the chat box and uh, Molly will either unmute you and let you to uh, ask the question in person or she can ask the question from the chat box. Um, and uh, I'm ready to take any questions that you guys have. Yeah. The mic, if you speak up clearly, the mic actually should be able to pick you up, but I'll repeat your question just in case. Um, so, 
I mean, how do you spend a fair amount of time on social media? Is that the conversation? How do you engage with people who use the Bible as a weapon? You are like arguing and not really representing Christ with like other people who they disagree with. Yeah, practically speaking, it's very difficult. And probably we should just back down in many cases. I don't think social media is the best platform for dialogue and discussion. And so you see these threads that will, will carry on. Somebody will post a Facebook, um, uh, will pass on an article. And the next thing you know, there's this massive argument going on back and forth. And are you really getting anywhere? I truly believe that true conversations come through relationship and don't tend to come in places where you can hide. And it's too easy to hide on the internet. And it's too easy to stay in a silo on the internet and get lots of other people who will stay in your position and then feel like you're right. Um, it's really important to find places where um, people of different perspectives gather together. And that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where there's young and old, uh, where there's male and female, where there's black and white, where, it, where we are challenged by one another um, so that we're not all uniformly thinking exactly the same way. I don't think that's healthy for any of us. So I don't have a good practical answer to your question other than largely stay out of Facebook debates. It, it just enrages the conversation. Um, if someone is, if someone really wants to talk, try and get them to go out for coffee. You know, arguing with that guy in California. Um, really, really, from a Christian character perspective, is this beneficial to to you and your community here, or to that person in that community there? Probably not. That's the challenge of global. It's part of the challenge of the global conversation is we're trying to make all these conversations way too big. If the Bible has always been culturally located, you know, first in a Jewish setting and then culturally located in its various locations around the world, which is why we have so many different streams, part of it has to do with culture. What does it mean for the, the Bible to be, have its voice here in Ottawa with these people in this time, in this place? shouldn't necessarily look exactly the same as as the church in Argentina it just doesn't that doesn't necessarily make sense you did a loaded question for you okay if the bible is going to be culturally interpreted different depending mm -hmm. on where you are and yeah. maybe should be uh how do you also build a unified church as we're called to be in most of Paul's letters mm -hmm. It is a loaded question. Humility is the first word to any of these conversations. And the first thing I always go back to with the Bible is in the very first chapters of scripture, Adam and Eve are told that they're not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there is something in that image that is exceedingly powerful. The one thing they're not allowed to do is eat from the all-knowing tree. And yet time and time again, the, there's an arrogance and pride factor that falls into all human beings where they, they want to be right and they want to be all-knowing. And I think it brings us right back to that initial narrative. Everything begins to fall apart as soon as we uh, want to be right and all-knowing. So I guess there's a humility factor. I also think that this is the importance of tradition and working in, in the context of tradition, um, to keep it simple. I go back to things like the Nicene Creed and, and, and the Apostles' Creed. You know, these are short formations of what Christianity is all about that go back to the early church, um, you know, into the first few hundred years of the church. And the reason that these were produced was because there was all kinds of forms of Christianity that were floating around and they wanted something simple and pithy. This is what unites us. Now, were there probably different components of Christianity that existed already then? Yes. Did they try and rein them in? I'm gonna guess not really. 
I'm going to guess they say, well, here's the essentials. You know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, were there other things that people sometimes believed? I'm sure there were. And they probably said, that's fine. That's interesting. That's interesting. But this is essentially what Christianity is. So this is the smell test. And the rest, there's lots of room for us to discuss. So culturally, I think sometimes you can have various forms of, of, of understandings of what scripture is saying. I think it, it can look very different. It's fine. I think there's probably more room for us to, to work together. Does it meet the smell test? Does it, does it still hit the essentials? I think we need a little more flexibility. Now, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is the, is the center of the Christian church and that everything depends on the incarnation and on the reality of heaven and earth meeting in one spot. There's a lot of room after that. Now, some people will totally disagree with me on that. Again, I'm okay with that. Uh, I have to be. If I'm going to take that stance, I have to be okay with the fact that sometimes people will strongly disagree with me. I love them just the same. Yeah. Um, in the church, what do you think has priority uh, between truth and unity when it comes to the extreme circumstances where one has to be chosen above the other? Um, which one's more important to the church? What's more important, truth or unity? Yeah. Uh, that's a t I, don't, I don't even know if that's a fair question, Sam. Because the question assumes... Um, again, that, that truth that can be pinned down. And I guess my argument would, it would be that at times when you're trying to pin down the truth, even of how scripture forms and changes us, it's kind of like that butterfly project where, you know, you collect all the butterflies and you pin them to a board so you can show all the different types of butterflies. But the reality is, is, is it really a butterfly when there's no life left in it anymore? Cause it's a dead butterfly. And, and sometimes that seems to be the way we approach Christian truth. It's, it has to be this, 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 and this. And I would say it is those things, but it's more malleable than that. And that's not simply being relative, because I think the argument then sometimes is, oh, you're just being relative and you know, all truth is, is open and equal. No, no, it, it still has smell tests. And I think still think you want to work in integrity and unity. But, I, I think at times, a community can be very diverse. It can be more diverse than, than we let it. I mean, a church might make a stand to say, this is what we believe, and this is what we have discerned as a community to be the way to follow Jesus. But it still should be filled with some people who are still a part of that community who say, I'm not sure I necessarily totally agree with everything here, but it's the people here that are a part of the body of Christ, that I am trying to live out being the body of Christ together with them. Being a Christian is not about being right. <coughs> so your position on truth not necessarily being narrowed down, isn't that also like not consistent with the context in which the Bible was written, because the whole idea that like truth is not knowable is a newer concept, right? Like postmodernism. So in, in in the in Paul's letters, you see often he's just calling out false teaching, or like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. 
And so I think the, the, the earlier question about like truth or unity, it, 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 it does happen, right? Like I think there, like with the Nicene Creed, there, there will be things that you say that this is fundamental. This is non-negotiable for me to call this Christianity and not something else. Correct. And, and so I guess, uh, yeah. How, uh, despite there being uh, areas of gray and how the Bible is cross-cultural, you, you still believe that us modern day Westerners or like growing up in like a Western context can discern absolute truths from the Bible. Yes, but ultimately the absolute truth is Jesus Christ. And so truth in that way is about a person and a relationship first. Um, it's about a relationship with God. And that is, that, that's the distilling truth of Scripture. Um, and so that, you know, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. I agree with you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, but I'm thinking in terms of this, this larger question for everybody. So I, I'm married to, to Brenda, and I don't think she's on here, so I can talk about her, right? It's, uh, of course, no. Uh, I, I'm married to Brenda, and I am in relationship with Brenda, and in being in relationship with Brenda, um, I'm discovering more and more truth. Truth about myself, truth about uh, who I am as a person in this world, who I am as a person in relationship, who I am as a, uh, a person that is also parenting children. And there's something about in that relationship that is forming and changing me. And I may have had a lot of truths that I discerned about family life based on my experience or even even practices that scripture teaches me about, about what it means to be a good uh, husband or a, a, a good parent. There's lots of good truths that I can discern from that. But the absolute truth in terms of what it means for me to be that husband and that parent is actually found in the practice of living out that relationship with Brenda. And I'm discovering it's, it's far deeper, more profound, more challenging, and sometimes way more life-giving than any text or any um, particular uh, set of, of good habits and practices about what it means to be a good parent or good husband would be. And so then you'd say, well, if you're learning all these good truths, shouldn't you put them down and package them and give them to someone else? And it's like, yeah, I'll let them. We've immediately come back to this idea that it, it's, it's an easy nugget. It's not. Relationship is is something other than that. And that's, so when Jesus begins to talk about truth, and I think Paul, when he, when he gets into passages about false teachers and so forth, if you actually get into most of those passages, it, it, they tend to be places where Paul is challenging people who are, are trying to pin down the following of Jesus in a very particular manner that includes this, 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 and this. And Paul is usually driving them back to the celebration of this freedom and relationship we have with God through Christ Jesus. And, in, and when you're trying to create this other type of narrative, uh, you're getting away from that, that transformative relationship component that is fundamental to the Christian way. Yeah. On another tangent, there's a question from Omar. Omar asks, said, what do you think of the rising censorship that we see on social networks? For example, um, there are certain countries where you can be banned for talking about pro-life uh, matter, matters. Well, uh, yeah, it's not even, I mean, I think that's a problem. Um, I think any time there is not a certain amount of ability to be able to speak and discuss, we lose that relationship. We lose the ability to actually grow. Uh, so that's, that's crucial. Um, usually when there's any type of dictatorial approach, 
uh, to a society, it's because people want to narrow it down to being right. This is, this is um, and it doesn't change us. And throughout history, whenever we see cultures where that is the dominant theme, where um, this is the way you must think and we will, we will punish you um, for thinking any differently, uh, those societies tend to um, look really ugly in, in, in the force of time. Um, and that's a bit of the, the, the frustration I would say I even have with the cancel culture that we're seeing now. It's less a, it's not so much a governmental control, at times you can even make arguments for that, um, but there, there is this popular discourse where um, I think people are scared to say anything um, for fear that it will be misinterpreted and there will be a public shaming um, and, and the consequences uh, go down. I, mean, I, I can even have that with, with allowing something like this to be live on Facebook. There's a little piece of me that says, um, I'm doing Q&A with a group of students and uh, a, a sponsoring church of the campus chaplaincy um, here's one line that I said, and I'm speaking off the cuff, and they could decide to make an entire issue about it without necessarily being in relationship with me and having a conversation or not saying, well, this is what we're discussing in the larger. When we get to that stage, I think we miss truth again. Again, it's relationship. Christ is a relationship. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, Omar, but uh, I think it's a problem, and I and it's and it's a scary thing. Any other questions? Silence. Any other questions from those who are watching from a distance? And you can take it in a different direction. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I I do like those people that if you're really trying to speak and love the Bible and understand what you're trying to share with, they like you shoot you down, like, you know. Well, there's two parts to that. One, I think we always have to be gracious. But my first question is always, when someone is shooting down, if they're shooting you down, there's probably a reason for it. There's probably something behind it. And this is the important of active listening. If someone's shooting you down, Maybe they've had an experience, or maybe they've, they've, they've witnessed something, or maybe their perception has turned something inside of them that makes them angry. Maybe they have family or friend or someone who's been hurt by it. We need to acknowledge that. Like that, that needs to be heard. Now, often in the moment, it's not necessarily the time, but if you, if you go on the defense and turn it into I'm right, you're wrong conversation, you're never going to get to the root of what's what's deeper churning inside of people and churning their 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 fears, their hopes for what society should look like. Or so again, this goes back to relationship. If this person is is intent on shooting you down, you got to read the situation first to be able to say, do I even do I even push back or is this the wrong time and place? But most often, I want to hear more. I don't want to give them the right answers. I want to hear more. Tell me more. <laughs> you, you seriously have, you, you have a, a, an ax to grind about Christianity. Tell me more. Um, I want to understand where they're, where they're coming from. Uh, because I think there is a lot of misinformation about Christianity that exists in the public sphere. And, and I am one of those people that believe in the Western society in a place like Canada, so much of the way we do culture has Christian moorings. That many of the things that people want to challenge, um, the reality is, is when you, if you want to push too hard, you could easily say, um, 
you know, if you want to challenge Christianity, you also have to then challenge this, 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 and this. I mean, it's complicated, but I, I think you just want to get to know that person first. I, I have, I have many friends who are not Christians at all, and sometimes we have these great conversations about it. And some of them have real access to grind, but we're still, we're still good friends um, because there's something deeper going on than just being right. And relationships, we all know, take time. Uh, and I don't think we should go into that relationship with the sense of, okay, if I can build a relationship with them, then I'm doing it so that one day I can change their mind. That's the wrong attitude. I need to love a person for who they are, not for who I think they should be. Um, and, and if I truly love them, I'm going to take them seriously. And still, I can still hold to what I need to believe, but there are also maybe things I need to learn. Um, that's, that's the reality, too. Um, but my challenge then for those within the Christian community, part of the reason that we always want to dig deeper, deeper into what we believe and why we believe it and get beyond just the, the simple truth nuggets that uh, the Internet wants to spit out at us um, or, or um, just cheap surface-level theology, we want to dig deeper so that when we get into those situations, we're not feeling anxious. I don't have to be anxious. I'm okay. I know that there are, there are moments and things in Christian history where we've gone wrong. And yep, guess what? Where there are humans, there will be problems, no matter what your faith or belief is. And there's also really lousy non-Christians too. Um, there's been lots of regimes and people groups and things who have done terrible things. And, uh, Part of why I'm a Christian is because I know I need something other than myself. I know myself well enough to be suspect of myself. Hmm. Question, I'm not exactly sure how to word it though. Um, I've had several conversations with friends, they're usually non-Christian friends, um, but like, and they're really intent on getting me to put Christianity in a box of either like right or left leaning like politically and I'm always at like kind of a loss for words of how to explain kind of like I don't think it should be in either like it's so like so much more than that like yeah just do you have any advice or thoughts on how to yeah go about that conversation with people <laughs> 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 Let me tell you, if I had the answer, the easy answer to that one, I would be the guy selling that truth nugget book that was making millions of dollars right now. <laughs> I don't. It breaks my heart, to be honest. And I don't think this is our day and age is, is all that different than any other day and age. I think over the course of history, there are flare ups where the, the, the desire to be right. Politically speaking, I think diversity is really important. I think plurality is actually really important. Um, so I, I, I always say resist. You know, and part of, with Feast and Faith, I have this all the time. The temptation would be to, to get speakers that will, will only speak in, in one aura of Christianity. But part of why we do panels like next week and have an Orthodox and, and a Presbyterian and a Baptist person speaking to it is because we want to try and get beyond that. Um, and I think it's really important politically to, to recognize that uh, in any good society, we're always making compromises. There's no such thing as, as, as a perfect political party with perfect political platforms. It does not exist and it never has and it never will. We love democracy because it is, um, it's the best of the worst when it comes to politics. It's, it, it's, it, has, it has more safeguards than, many other, than a lot of other forms of, of politics. But then as Christians, we need to think about how we're being a part of good compromise in a public society. And therefore, I, I want, Christians who tend to have a more socialist leaning approach to things. And I want some Christians in the mix 
who tend to be maybe a little more libertarian, or, you know, and the, of that type of conservatism. And I want in between because it reflects something of the diversity of life. I resist it. Um, I, I say resist it. You know, I, I, I think it's, I think usually when Christians align themselves with one political way, you tend to find very shallow, cheap Christianity. And I'm probably overstating it, but yeah. I hope for all of you, for those of you who do Facebook, that your, your feed does not have only one type of people and political commentary coming in it. I hope you have both sides. That's actually probably healthy. It's probably healthier not to be on Facebook at all. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I may just have a degree in political science, yes. Sorry, I failed on the intro, guys. <laughs> yeah, you know what? So I'll just get to your question too. When I went into studying politics, um, I was coming out of Southern Alberta. I had very strong and set political ideas, very strong. Um, I understand Alberta politics very well because I, I know my own journey. Uh, and in studying politics and digging deeper into both philosophy and theology, what I, what I coming out of my political science degree, I found it much harder to participate in public um, in public politics in terms of a very practical which party would I be a part of. I found it very difficult at that point because I could I was wrestling with different elements of the parties. So that's a different topic though. We will be talking about politics and faith in October. There's a direct one. Yes, Teresa. So, um, how do you convince Christians that, um, think like spread ideas, like political ideas, more than actual Bible facts and truths, like in terms of the Bible? Mm. You know, what's intriguing about that question is there are different types of churches that present different types of political ideals. And some churches are better at hiding the politics by um, bumper stickering it with some, some Bible verses. So some churches, um, they, they, they say they're not talking politically, but if you understand politics at all, you can quickly hear through their, their Bible message that it's actually very political. Um, and then sometimes you can also have churches that don't bumper sticker the theology in here. You think like, how come you're not talking more about scripture, but yet I'm hearing scripture all the way through what they're saying. So it's tough to pin down which churches those would be. Now, I don't want to evade that because I think there are churches who do a lot of wonderful things. But when I think about participation in the life of a church. I think it is very much about faith formation around the Christian tradition. And so some churches are, it's all tradition, but that's, there, there, there are reasons for that. And there's some very good reasons for that because it's forming around who Jesus Christ is. And the practices are always drawing people back to who Jesus Christ is. And, and, there are also churches who do it very well in terms of the, the scripture preaching is the focus. And there's something that's very directly, how do we form ourselves around God's word, around, uh, around the sacraments and around that we should be formed by those things, that those things should be the centrality of that community. So that when we're gathering together as a people group, it's, it's forming something in, internally in us that causes us to then take that into everything else we do in the rest of the week. I sometimes say that you know, church on Sunday is a little bit like doing practice for the rest of the week. 
what you're doing on Sunday, you should be doing every day of the week. But it's, there's something in that formation that you take in the rest of the week. Where churches sometimes go wrong is where they turn Sunday into a place where they can give you activities, Christian activity to do during the week. And this, this is the Christian activities you should do this week. And for some, that might be, you need to go out and, and evangelize and do these types of things. So and it sounds really great. And, and, and I think evangelism is important, but it's something to do. It's like, these are the things you have to do to be Christian, as though those things are separate from when you go to work uh, in the government and the, the things you're doing there are not Christian. Those things are Christian too. Um, everything we do is, is, is God-centered. But then you also have churches who um, almost become so focused on social justice narrative that they're also telling you things you should go out and do. Here are the, here are the 10 things of social justice orientation you need to do. And as though, again, everything else that they do without their week is somehow not a part of the Christian story. So I guess I would challenge any church leader to always be asking, how are your habits and practices as a gathering of people shaping and forming people's hearts and minds to participate in God's world? Uh, and think about how everything you do is redemptive. How, how, is, how is that forming you? If you're simply telling your people what you should be doing this coming week, I, I, I think that misses you. I think that misses what church is supposed to be. Does that get at your question? That is my question. Okay. And I do think it's really important to participate in the life of church. I think it's important to choose a community and participate in it, even if at times um, you're like, I, I just fundamentally disagree with what I just heard off the pulpit. <laughs> I mean, within, within reason. Um, I think if you're fundamentally hearing something, there's a conversation to be had. There's, there should be, now it's, time, now it's time for us to grow and think through this, but the church is bigger than that. So I guess it's, it's important for us to participate in places where we don't necessarily agree with everything. Um, the body of Christ is diverse. You know, that's important. Yeah. You're also why not to say people who are kind of jumping around from church to church and maybe not kind of choosing them. Absolutely. So by your practice, what you're doing, you're saying the church is all about me. And so it's a consumer mentality. It goes against the exact grain of what we're called to be as Christians. We're not called to be consumers of God's world. We're called to be stewards of God's world. So if I'm jumping around from church to church and not putting roots somewhere, I'm being a consumer. I'm, I'm, I can go right back to Genesis 1 and say, I'm missing the entire point of what it means to be a steward of God's world. Formation takes place in, in rooted locations, which again is why I'm nervous about the conversations happening simply on a virtual world and us having conversations with people in Europe and, and so forth, we lose that local center of what it means to be rooted right where I am right here, form, forming with people that I can, I won't touch because it's COVID and we're not supposed to touch, but people I can touch, people I can hug. You know, that's, 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 that's the challenge of the pandemic. Like, I mean, it's supposed to be this earthy, physical reality that we live, which is why I encourage people to get involved in, in baking for the less fortunate and being a part of, of doing, um, supper table and things like that. I don't want people to participate so that you can pat yourself on the back and say, look at me, I, I've done my, my Christian duty just like the pastor told me on Sunday. No, we do this because it forms us and roots us in the reality of the lives of the people all around us. That's who God calls us to be as stewards of his creation. So if this is the neighborhood that I'm a part of, and in my neighborhood are, are, are less fortunate people, and there's this place that I can go and meet and get to know them, uh, or, or have some kind of connection to them, I should probably be doing those types of things. You know, it's way too easy to say, well, I gave my $50 to World Vision. Nothing against World Vision, but we need, we need to be rooted and, and formed by the spaces that God calls us to right here.
All right, we are probably running. Yeah, it's 10 after seven already. So any last question or something else that's still burning or anything that's coming in from chat? Well, thank you for your time tonight. I would encourage you to participate in Bible study and with other students and feel rooted, especially during the pandemic. Small communities are important. So if you're interested in being part of uh, men's Bible study, um, uh, Sam, Mim, talk to them. If you want to do essential Bible texts with me uh, and look at 15 essential texts of the Bible that help frame our understanding of what scripture is, let me know. If you want to be involved in the supper table, put a star beside the name on there. If any of you are online, you can just text me or text Molly or text uh, someone you know in this list to say, I'd like to get involved in um, helping to serve at St. Joe's supper table on Wednesdays. Great. These are all important things for our formation and shaping the mission. Um, and I would encourage you to do them, especially now, especially during this space of such isolation where everybody is told to go even more in. Uh, too easy to be an individual. So thanks everybody for your time tonight. And uh, next week, again, we have a panel on what does the church look like during a time of COVID? Who are we to be moving forward coming out of this? Again, it's Jason Byers, Celebration Church, Jim Pott from Knox Presbyterian, and uh, Anthony Murad uh, from St. George's Coptic. Thanks, everybody.